Hello everybody, my name is Nemo and welcome back to another magic video. Today we are playing Jules the Planes Orcs 2014 and I'm going to be talking about another deck, sort of the Samurai deck build time with Anka Nemo. So this deck I've been kind of ignoring because it's a very one dimensional deck to play. It's not really that difficult to build either. Um, the main problem you're going to run into is, uh, you know, balancing how many creatures you want and how many lands you want and stuff like that. Um, other than that, you know, the individual cards are pretty obvious uh, for the most part. So um, This deck also plays very one dimensional. Either you get your equipment and you e easily bash your opponent or you don't get it. Or they uh, keep killing you guys uh, and you easily lose to your opponent. So <clears throat> this build I think is mostly what most people run. Uh, there could be some minor differences but if, for the most part it's pretty easy to build this deck. Um, we're running 25 lands here, 14 plains and 11 mountains, and we're not running any terramorphic expanses. So why 25 lands? Let's talk about that first. Well, if you look at the mana curve, it may look a bit, a bit ridiculous until you figure out that, hey, two of those three drops are most of the time actually five drops. I mean, you're sort of War and Peace and you're sort of Fire and Ice. You probably want to play those uh, and be able to equip. I mean, it's not necessary, uh, necessarily needed, but if somebody, uh, you know, messes up your strategy and basically time walks you by destroying your creature when you're trying to equip, like, a lot of the time that can cost you two whole turns. So, having a bunch of lands out isn't necessarily that bad, even though this is an aggro deck, um, because that allows you to just play another dude when they do that, or equip another, uh, equip another dude, or play a dude, equip that one, um, which makes it not so much of a time war walk on their part, um, and makes this deck a lot easier to to actually play um, when you're not constantly getting uh, tempo disadvantage from having to spend turns trying to equip. So I do run 25 lands for that reason. Uh, we're not running the Terramorphic Expanses. Um, so this is only a dual color deck. It's not really that needed uh, to have Terramorphic Expanses in there. And it is an aggro deck, so you don't really want to ha have to spend a turn popping those uh, Terramorphic Expanses. Um, I find that with this deck, I really want to make the most out of my mana each and every turn. So I'd rather just have a land, uh, an, a normal land that I can actually use that turn. And there's not a lot of chance to get uh, color screwed in this deck anyways. It's not that many creatures that require double of a certain color. Um, there are a bunch of uh, one drops that cost white, obviously. So um, most of the time, you're not really going to need those Terramorphic Expenses. And they're probably going to hurt you more than they're going to help you uh, when you're trying to curve out. So, <clears throat> what we are running here is Kanda's Isamara, Isamaru, Hound of Kanda. We're also running the Devoted Retainer. Just the Wonder Ups. The Wonder Ups are important because it helps you curve out um, in an aggressive deck. Makes makes sense, right? Don't really need to explain that one. We're running Path to, Path to Exile because it's an amazing card. And we're running Steel Shape of Gift because it gives you more copies of... Uh, or a more chance to actually get um, Imuzawa's Jite. Or any of the uh, swords that you that you might want to get. Sometimes it's better to get a sword with a protection from whatever color they're playing. Because um, that's just super powerful as well. But obviously, Ijite is the best card in the deck. So that's what you're most of the time going to get. We're not running Manatav. It's one of those cards I would love to put in there. Because I think it's a very fun card. And it's really nice to get someone with it. But most of the time I actually use it. It's a protected dude. And in that case, you may as well just include another creature in your deck. Why not, right? So, <clears throat> we are also not running Brute Force. Because again, if you run out of creatures with this deck, then you're not in, in that great of a spot. So I'd rather just run more creatures rather than uh, the combat tricks. Um, you don't really need the combat tricks if you're winning. That is, if you've got a sword or a GTA equipped, then you don't, probably don't really need Brute Force. It would just only... Uh, win the game for you faster. If you don't have a GTA or a sword, you'd rather just draw that instead of brute force or you'd rather draw a creature um, or, or a card that can get you to one of those swords. So, um, and, and otherwise, I mean, you're probably not winning anyway if you don't have a sword or GTA. So, it's kind of a moot point that, that, uh, that point. <laughs> point, point. Point, point, point. Sounds like I'm playing Pong here. Um, Kanda's Hatamoto, I think, is better than Battle Mad Ronin. Uh, simply because you know it's a little, it has a little bit more toughness and it can actually block. And I mean, the fact that this is Bushido too doesn't matter that much uh, since you know most of the time people aren't blocking you anyways, or they're chump blocking you if you've got a sword equipped. So um, 
We got Hand of Honor here. Protection from black, push it one. Black decks are a problem for this deck to deal with. Especially since they've got a lot of removal and it's, you know, it, it's basically like being time walked upon where you're trying to equip your, uh, e equip your equipment and they kill your dude in response. So having something that has protection from black, very nice, especially since there's no sort of protection from black <laughs> in the deck. So, uh, we got Arabus Moth Rider. I don't really care that it's just a 1-1. One -one. I mean, I care that it's a flying guy and, um, yeah, I mean, get spider, get spider dudes, and if you got a sword, that's pretty nice. <coughs> pretty nice. Suddenly turn into a woman, excuse me. Uh, Amuzha Vajit, yeah, what can I really say about the card? It is insane, it is ridiculous. The most ridiculous thing is that uh, for two of these things, you don't even need to have it equipped, as long as you've got counters on it. It puts two charge counters on it, you don't need to deal damage to a player, it just, all, all kinds of brokenness going on here. It's two to play, two to equip. Um, yeah, just ridiculously good card. Got four copies of Lightning Helix because it's really good removal. And then we've got the Kanda's Banner, which um, there's a lot of legendaries in the deck, but still not enough to make this playable. Um, I mean, it's basically relying on, a, on... It's basically like playing Russian Roulette, um, except you don't actually kill yourself <laughs> if you lose. But, it, you know, it, it's betting on getting a legendary, because otherwise this thing doesn't do anything, so, yeah. Uh, we've got no duchy, uh, it's not a bad card, but it easily gets outclassed by the other equipment, so why would you run it? We've got double cleave, which is awesome with Ujite. However, it's not so awesome when you've got uh, one of the other two swords, because, well, you can't actually play this. Because, <laughs> um, you know, both of them give protection from red, so. Yeah, that that is a downside to this card, uh, and again, you don't particularly need the uh, combat trick here. It is... It's kind of like win more even with the Gita, because Gita is probably going to win you the game anyways, but eh, sometimes it would be nice, I suppose. We've got Call to Glory, which I'm not running. I don't care about blocking that much, so meh. Again, not a combat trick, and another one, don't need that one either. So we've got Gift of Estates, which is a card you could consider running, um, especially if you uh, happen to run more high-cost creatures than I am. And <clears throat> if there are mo multiple copies of Gift of Estates, uh, you know, that could be a strategy, but since there's only one, you can't really rely on getting it. And this deck, more than anything, just wants to be an aggressive deck. So, one would think that, hey, why don't I just add the Gift of the States, take out a land, and be done with it. I mean, I'm probably going to get two lands, so this is going to get me more lands than having one land. Problem with that is, you want to curve out, and you want to be playing a two-drop, rather than uh, doing nothing with Gift of the States. Best case scenario is you keep on drawing a land, up to five, you uh, and you can curve out each turn. That's just so much better. Uh, again, playing this instead of a two drop, basically again is like being time walked upon. So um, tempo, as you can tell, is pretty important when you're trying to equip stuff and people keep killing your dudes in response. Then yeah, it is important to uh, you know be able be able to curve out and play your stuff. Um, <clears throat> so we are running Masako, the humorless, and uh, yeah. I mean, I don't really care about blocking, like I said, so why do I run this one? Well, because it has Flash. <laughs> and that's really nice. If it, it just gets around sorcery speed removal. If all you need to do is get one hit in with Jite, or, uh, you know, get a dude equipped with, with a sword, then being able to get around sorcery speed removal is key. It is so good to just drop this at the end of your opponent's turn and immediately equip on your turn. Just really really nice so that's the main reason to run her um it maybe i i'm not sure <laughs> probably a her um i should make jokes like really uh kitsune blade master is uh it's pretty good i mean if you've got jita which triggers when you don't even have to deal combat damage to a player you can just do it in combat and you've got something that has first strike i mean that is ridiculous so many tricks available with First Strike and Jita. I mean, if, if in case you don't get it, uh, you equip Jita on this and um, you attack with the team and they block in such a way that one of your dudes will die. Well, First Strike triggers the, triggers the Jita f before anything else happens. You get the counters on the Jita. Now before normal combat da damage happens, you can use the counters from Jita to change the outcome of combat. And that is ridiculously good. So... Um, like, 
this guy basically with Vita on it and no counters on the Vita can kill a 5-5 and not die. That is just great. So we've got Sword of Fire and Ice and we've got Sword of War and Peace. They are pretty good and just basically, uh, you know, sometimes you want to get these instead of Vita. Uh, if your opponent is running a deck that just can't handle them. Most of the time Vita is obviously the better card though, but uh, yeah. If someone's running colors that can't handle with these can't can't handle these swords, then they're pretty good to get. And uh, it, it's nice to include these as well as Gita and as well as the tutoring for Gita because it just gives you more 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 chance of actually drawing any of it. Uh, we've got Oathkeeper, Takano's Dice Show, basically the fourth sword in this deck, and uh, one could consider running this one. What it does is it kind of protects your guys from removal, but you have to get it equipped first, which is a big problem. Um, I mean, they're gonna kill your guy in response to you equipping uh, Sword of Fire and Ice, and they're also gonna kill your guy in response to you equipping uh, Oathkeeper Takano's Dice Show. The one thing is, like, if they have a bunch of removal and uh, you can somehow get this equipped for the plate, and that's pretty nice, but yeah, other than that, um, I mean, what it tries tries to do is save your guys from removal, but then they can just kill it in response to you equipping it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> it is a decent card, and it's worth considering, like I said. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not running it. Uh, it is the weakest of the uh, swords. Well, it is, you know, if it's at fourth place. <laughs> it's weaker than uh, Gita and Sword of Fire and Ice and War and Peace. Uh, I mean, Fire and Ice and War and Peace, like that. <laughs> Just have to do it perfectly, don't I? Uh, Tenza's Godo's Mile. Um, sure, it's. Nah, uh, no, I, I don't have anything good to say about this card. Even if you're playing a legendary red creature, this still isn't worth your time. Come on. Even if you didn't have G10 and, and all that in the deck, this just isn't worth your time. This isn't either. Unless you've got haste creatures or something, I don't know. Even if you do. It's still not that good. It didn't even work that well in, in Trinity of the Elements. Which was all about these kinds of things happening, but... Eh. Intimidation Bolt. I'm not running because it doesn't go to the face like Lightning Helix does. It's also more expensive. Um, sometimes it can be okay. Uh, the most important thing for your deck is to be able to get by their dudes. And you don't necessarily care that much about them attacking you. So it's, you know, secondary ability isn't... Too relevant either. Um, <coughs> and yeah, it's pretty expensive, so that's why I'm not running it. We're running Nago, Bound by Honor, forecast 3 3. Push it up 1, so um, if you know it, and it gets gives all your samurai creatures plus 1 plus 1 when it attacks, and it gives your uh, your Kanda's Hatamoto's already plus 1 plus 1 as well because it's a legendary samurai, so pretty nice stuff here. Um, and he just gives himself plus 2 plus 2 if he's. In combat with another creature uh, when he's attacking, that is. But yeah, it's a pretty good card. Um, it can make you a pretty good rush uh, rush happen when you've got multiple dudes and no equipment or something like that. Um, so he's not to be underestimated. Fumiko the Low Blood, also pretty powerful. The only card in my deck that actually has red red in his mana cost, I believe. But she's worth it. She is worth it because it just makes combat miserable for your opponent. So great stuff. Uh, Glory of Warfare times 2. There's 4 available for the deck. I'm running 2. I don't ever want to draw both of them. So, running multiples of these means there's more chance of actually drawing more than one. And that's not a good thing. Um, and also, you want to have enough creatures to make your stuff happen. But this is a very powerful card, so I had to include some of them. Um, we're not running Indebted Samurai. Uh, it's just not as good as the other 4 drops. And... You don't want to run too many 4-drops, and this thing is generally just going to be worse than the 2-drop flyer. Um, and again, you don't want to run too many 4-drops in the first place anyways. Yeah, same goes for the 5-drops. I only want to run the best 5-drops. I believe these 3 are the best 5-drops. The Stone Ewer Giants are basically you know, auto-includes. You gotta have these. More ways to, to get your Gita or whatever you want out of the deck. And just really powerful cards in general. Um, Balefire Leech. I could see it being substituted for like uh, Zealous Conscripts or a 6-drop. Um, personally, I think this one is really powerful. If it survives, it can do a lot of work. So I like this one the best. Um, and if you get the 5 mana, it's most likely because 
there's some kind of you know uh, stall going on where the opponent has his creatures back and you've got your creatures back and nobody really dares to attack. And Zealous Conscripts doesn't really do that much in a situation like that. Um, it mostly does something. If they keep one dude back for blocking or something like that, then Zealous Conscripts is really good. But it doesn't really generally happen with this deck once you get to 5 mana. Um, it's mostly going to be a race either way. So, Ihi Zuka, the Ruthless, it can be pretty good. And this actually does work with um, with, with uh, the swords getting them double strike. So that can be pretty nice. He, he's a pretty powerful card. And I can definitely see you including that one instead of Bale Fire Leaves. But my, uh, my theory is if I have to start playing 5 drops, it's probably because I didn't get a sword. So um, if you don't have a sword, this guy becomes less good. Uh, we've got uh, 6 drops here. I, I just not not running six drops simply because I consider this is uh, an aggro deck um, this one what does it even do Bushido 2 each other samurai creature you control gets plus one plus one for each point of Bushido eh, it's decent it's like the Lord of the Samurais I suppose eh, but it's a six mana Lord that's pretty expensive uh, Yose is a very good card uh, but there's decks in this format that just once you get to the late game they are just simply stronger than this deck so you want to kill them as fast as possible this may not really help, especially if they play like a phantom image and you're just in even more trouble. So it's not really worth it that much. Godo doesn't do anything the turn he comes into play, he does something the turn after. And I think, he, and it's already 6 mana, so you gotta get the 6 mana, then you gotta wait another turn. It's pretty slow. It's a good card though for what it does. We've got Ryusei, the fa Falling Star. Um, yeah, it's decent. Probably gonna blow up your side, but you've got a 5 uh, Flying Dragon. Well, actually you don't, because it happens when he dies. Okay, so basically, you get a 5-5 Flying Dragon, and when he dies, not only do you lose your 5-5 Flying Dragon, you also lose all your other creatures. That doesn't seem too good. <laughs> Just saying. Tatsumasa, the Dragon's Fang. Um, very expensive equipment, and when we've got, uh, you know, other equipment that's simply better than this one, that is way less expensive, then I don't really see the point in playing it. Warstorm Surge, yeah. Um... Very fun card, I'll, I'll give it that. I mean, I love the Trinity of Elements, and uh, this was probably my favorite card in it, but um, yeah, it just doesn't fit this deck, it's too slow. Kanda, Lord of Igonjo. Well, I've got this Hound in the deck, but I don't, don't have him in the deck. Um, yeah, Vigilance, Indestructible, Bushido, Bishu Bushoda, whatever it is, <laughs> Bushido 5. Um, I mean, he doesn't die. <laughs> He he's 8-8 eight, eight when he is in combat with other creatures, but why would anybody block him? I don't get it. Uh, Miojin of Cleansing Fire. It's mass removal, basically. It's very expensive, but it's mass removal, and you get a 4-6 out of the deal. It's decent if you actually get to 8 mana. Um, like, if there are multiple copies of uh, Gift of Estates, then maybe there will be a different build for this deck available, where you include more of those kinds of cards, but nope. Uh, Avatar of Slaughter, nah, we're getting ridiculous at this point. Um, even more ridiculous. Miojin of Infinite Rage. Um, so this is a cat? I'm not sure. So Miojin is basically a title then. I, I thought it was a name, but yeah, so it's not the same person or anything. Okay, just saying. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so it's a 10 cost well, uh, yeah this is pretty ridiculous <laughs> let's be honest that's just pretty ridiculous alright so that's basically the deck build um, and we're gonna get into a game in the next video I hope you guys enjoyed this one and um, my name is Nemo my name will still be Nemo next time see you then thanks a lot for watching guys